Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of images of boats. Uh, so we have a train folder with a bunch of different boat types, I think nine different types of boats, and we're going to try to predict the type of boat based on the images. Now before we get started, I'd like to point out we don't have too many images here. Um, we have only 30, 16 in this one, so there is quite a class imbalance here. Um, I'm not going to focus on addressing it in this video, I'm just going to show how to set up the model, but uh, we may, if you wanted to, maybe perform image augmentation to create uh, duplicates of the undersampled, I mean, underrepresented classes. Uh, that may be a way to address it. Well, let's hop into the notebook. Um, we're going to use NumPy Pandas OS and the path object from pathlib for, pre uh, for working with the data, uh, for getting the images loaded in. Uh, and then we'll use PyPlot and Seaborn for visualization. We're going to do a confusion matrix at the end. And then a uh, train test split function just for uh, pre processing. Uh, we will create the model with TensorFlow and then we'll evaluate it with a confusion matrix and classification report from sklearn. So let's go ahead and import that. And we're going to uh, first start off by creating the train directory, or at least uh, specifying it. And so we can get the train directory uh, up here. Let me zoom in. Uh, we copy the file path to the train folder. And I don't want to just paste it as a string. I'm going to turn it into a pathlib path object, which allows for a lot of nice operations on the directory path. So we run that. Um, and, okay, so the thing is, you know, let me call it imageDir. Because we only have one, let me call it imageDir. I'm not doing the t test set because they aren't labeled. Uh, we don't have a way to evaluate that. So. Um, when, when you have one folder with all your images, um, well, normally the way you, you take, you flow the images in is with the Keras uh, image data generator. And that has a function called flow from directory, which lets you, it automatically sees the classes based on the name of the folder, and it will flow in the, the images uh, through that way. The only problem with that is that you can only make two splits out of it. You can do train set and validation set, but you can't get a third test set out of that. So in that case, it's best to use a flow from data frame function that also comes from the image data generator. Um, and I'll show how to do that today. Basically, what we want to do is create a list of the image file paths. Uh, if we take our image dir and we can use the glob function, uh, because we turned it into a path object, we get to use this nice function that allows us to search for um, uh, items in the directory that car that uh, fall into the that we can specify with this glob expression. So I want to target um, anything ending with JPEG, but I don't care what folder it's in. So I'm doing star star slash. That means any sort of file path leading up to something dot JPEG. Uh, and that will create, create a uh, generator object. We can then get a list of it by turning it into a list. Uh, and now we'll get all the file paths to every example, every training uh, image. And you'll see that it goes between folders. It doesn't care about the folder because we specified this star star. So um, we'll call this image files. That'll be the name of this list. And then what I want to do is I want to extract the labels out of it. So that would be the name of the folder that comes before the file name. So to do this, um, we can take image files, which again looks like this, and we can use this nice uh, function from OS, which is os.split, that can split a pathlib path object into the prefix and suffix, where the suffix is just the file name and the prefix is all the directories that come before it. So we'll do that twice to get the, the one right here. So we can map this function to here. Um, I'm going to map a function that for every x in this uh, image file list, we're going to do os.path.split on x. And uh, yeah, I'll show you what that looks like. If we then turn that map object into a list, uh, you can see it has split off the file name from the rest of the file path. Now. Um, if we just take the first element of that split, then we'll just get this thing. And we can split that again with os.path.split to split off the name of the class. And we only get the second element from that. And there we go. We have the names of the classes for every one. So let's go ahead and call that labels. That's our list of labels. Uh, so we have the file paths and the labels associated with those file paths. Uh, and then what I'll do is create an image data frame called imageDF 
which is a pandas data frame. Uh, and I'll construct it using dictionary format. So I'm going to create a column called file path that consists of image files and a column called label, which consists of the labels. Um, then, since I'm sort of splicing them all together in order, oh, first we should actually cast it into a string list because when, when we pass it through the flow data frame, a uh, flow from data frame function, it will require that there are strings. Um, and then we're also going to sample 100% of the data, which is the same as a, uh, a shuffle. Because we just want, because they're all in order, it'd just be nice to shuffle the data so that we have scramble classes. Um, and so this is sampling 100%, fraction 100% of the data. And we'll include a random state since it is random. We want to uh, ensure we can always reproduce the results. And then when we're done, we'll reset the index because the indices will also have been scrambled. So re uh, dot reset index, and I'm including drop equals true to prevent the old indices from becoming a new column. All right, so uh, yeah, let's take a look at that after. Image DF, and here it is. We have the file paths to each image and the label associated with them. And this is all you need to be able to use flow from data frame. So while we're at while we're doing this, let's take a look at the class distribution. Uh, so image DF sub label dot value counts. Uh, and we can see how many of each image we have. Now we have way more sailboats than anything else, and we have only 16 uh, inflatable boats. So there's quite a, a range of values uh, in the value counts. What we're probably going to see is that we'll have a very good classification uh, on sailboats. We're probably going to see a lot of misclassifications um, from other examples being predicted as sailboat. So because when you have a large uh, class imbalance, the, the model tends to care a lot more about this because it's, it's used to seeing the sailboats. So it'll, it'll probably tend to misclassify all the other ones as sailboat. Um, there's a few things we could do to address that. We might be able to change the uh, task to make it something the model is more capable of doing uh, because we do not have an even number of, of images here. For example, these are pretty equal. Maybe we could try to predict between gondola and cruise ship because that would be pretty balanced. Um, however, in general, we don't have a lot of images either. If we had more images, the model would probably be able to do better. Okay, so let's try, uh, for, let's do a train test split on this image, on this uh, data set. So we can train test split the data frame, which is image DF. This is with uh, sklearn's train test split function. We'll specify a, the size of our train set. So we'll send 70% of the data to the train set, which will then, you know, that will even further uh, reduce the amount of images we're training on. So not so good, but we have what we have. Um, and we're going to shuffle. So this is on by default, shuffle equals true. Uh, but because we're shuffling, we're going to include a random state to ensure the results are always reproducible. All right, and then we will create four new sets of the data. Actually, I will call them, sorry, this is actually creating two sets of data because we're only splitting one thing. And I'll call it train df and test df. Okay. So, now let's load the image data. So we have uh, basically right now a list of file paths and labels. Let's actually uh, tell the model how we're going to pull images through. So we're going to use image data generator. That's tf.keras.preprocessing.image.image data generator. Uh, and this uh, object allows us um, to look, allows us to load up uh, images uh, one batch at a time. This prevents the uh, the GPU from getting overloaded with me from memory problems. Uh, just just it keeps us from having to store all the images in RAM. Uh, after it's done with a batch, making predictions on the batch, uh, it'll put it it'll recycle the memory so that we don't run out of memory. Uh, and then we'll rescale this. Uh, so so rescale allows us to rescale the images so that the pixel values lie between zero and one. Uh, we just divide by the maximum uh, value in the original pixel values, which is usually 255, because uh, pixel intensity values are on a scale from 0 to 255. So if we divide that range or multiply by 1 over 255, uh, we will scale all the pixel values down to be between 0 and 1. Then we'll give a validation split. So when you're using image data generator, you can specify this to use the same generator to take two splits. So this is going to be our train generator. 
and we'll take the train and validation sets from this generator. Then for our test generator, uh, we'll also be the same thing, but we don't need a validation split. Uh, so remove that. All right, and then uh, we will actually flow the images. So train images, I'll call it, is train generator dot flow from data frame. Uh, we specify the data frame we're flowing from. That will be our train DF. The X column, that's our file path data, uh, column, which is file path. Our Y column, that's our label column, which is label. Target size, so we can rescale the images now. Um, this is sort of up to us. We, all, we want them all the same size, um, but the, more, the higher uh, resolution we pick, the better, the more information there is. So uh, how about we do 224? It's, pretty, it's a pretty standard size. Um, we'll also specify color mode. That's if it's RGB or grayscale, this is RGB color uh, images. Then our class mode, uh, because it's multi-class classification, this is categorical. Then uh, batch size. So we can actually split it into batches here so we don't have to do it uh, with the model. So we'll do 32. Shuffle equals true. And the seed will be 42. That's This is just a, like a random state to ensure we can reproduce the results. Then we include subset. And subset allows us to, to pull just the training set. And given the seed, it will always pull the same training set. So we'll do the same thing and we'll copy this over and create val images which is all the same except subset becomes validation. So these are both pulling from the same data frame using the same train generator, but uh, one is taking 70% of the data, storing that in train images, and the other is taking the other 30%, uh, sorry, 80% and 20%, the other 20% and storing it in val images. Last, we'll have our test images. So this is test images. And there's some differences here. Uh, this we're using test generator, which is the second one we, do, we, we used. And the data frame we're flowing from is test DF. Then down here, our subset we don't need. And we, we are making sure that our shuffle is false. We don't want to shuffle the test images because we want to be able to get the labels associated from them in the order they show up. All right, so it flowed the images. And you can see we have 651 train images, 162 validation images, and 349 test images. Now we'll do training. So we're going to create a convolutional neural network. Uh, the inputs is a tf.keras.input. The shape is going to be 224 by 224 by 3. 3 for the three color channels in RGB. And then we'll create our convolutional layers. So conv2d. We'll specify filters. That's how many times do we want to pass over the image uh, to extract a feature. Uh, so. 32, why not? Kernel size, uh, this is how big is the window, how many weights are we using to pass over the image. So a 3 by 3 window is pretty standard. We'll give it a ReLU activation, and we'll pass in inputs. So we'll copy this over, um, and then after each convolutional layer, we want to pool. So we'll use uh, max pooling, max pool 2D, and we pass in X, and we'll copy that over and do the same thing over here. All right, now we have hopefully extracted uh, enough features. If we run this and look at X, you can see we should now have um, new feature data in 54 by 54 by 32. So you can think of this as 32 two-dimensional features of size 54 by 54. Um, and we can hope that's enough. Now. At this point, we want to make it one-dimensional, so there's a few ways to do this. We could use tf.keras.layers.flatten and pass in x, and you can see that would flatten it out by taking the two dimension, all three dimensions, and just stringing it into a single, uh, a single one-dimensional vector. Uh, but usually, this is unnecessary. Um, usually, it doesn't. Uh, it's it's better to use global average pooling 2D. Although you can test out, see which which does better. This basically averages over the first two dimensions, so that we'll just get 32 uh, features, a uh, single number of features. So we'll use this over here, and then we'll have our outputs. 
this, well actually we should have a classification. So at this point we have extracted the features. Now we're going to use those features to perform classification. So I'll put one dense layer, tf.keras.layers.dense, um, maybe 64 neurons, ReLU activation function. Uh, why don't we do two with a few more neurons? Why not? And then our output will be tf.keras.layers.dense. And this is our number of classes now. We have nine classes, as you can see. And we need a softmax activation so that all of the probabilities sum, sum to one. So we'll get nine probability estimates all, all summing to one for a given image. And each one corresponds to a different class. Then we'll create our model with tf.keras.model, passing in the inputs as our inputs and outputs as our outputs. All right, then we'll compile the model. Model.compile, uh, we'll pick an optimizer, we'll just go with Atom. A loss function. Uh, so when you're using image data generator, you have to use categorical cross entropy, not sparse categorical cross entropy. And the reason for that, if we take, for example, we take test images and we grab a batch from it, call it next, uh, we use next to grab the first, the next batch. Um, and then we just look at the the labels, so a sub one. Uh, you can see that the labels are stored in a one hot format. Um, and so the reason we don't use sparse uh, is because this format allows for multi class uh, multi label uh, cla labels. So we could have a one here and a one here. There's no guarantee that this is sparse, even though it is encoded as sparse, where there's where there's only one each. Um, sparse categorical cross entropy is better when you just have integers as your classes because when those get converted into a one hot vector it's guaranteed to be sparse. Um, okay so categorical cross entropy and then metrics will be accuracy since it's multi-class uh, that's pretty much the best we have and then what we'll do is why don't we fit the model and store it in history so model.fit we're training on train images. Our validation data is val images. Uh, our epochs, we'll train for 100 epochs and we will use a callback, which is tf.keras.callbacks.early stopping. Uh, and this will monitor the validation loss. And when it notices the validation loss stops improving after uh, three epochs, however many we specify here, it will stop the training and restore the weights uh, from the best epoch. So restore best weights equals true. All right, uh, actually before I start training this, I'm gonna enable GPU acceleration since it's an image classification task. Um, so GPU, turn on, and I will rerun this notebook and when it finishes training, I'll resume the video. All right, so the training has finished. Um, and as you can see, we're not doing so well sort of as I suspected um, because of the class imbalance. So let's take a look at the results. So first what we'll do is evaluate the model. We'll store the results in uh, results with a model.evaluate on the test images. Uh, and we're gonna set verbose equals zero so we don't see the loading bar. Then we'll print out the loss from the test set. So test loss, uh, we'll display that to five decimal places with uh, and format that with uh, results sub zero. So the first value of results will be the loss, the second value will be the accuracy, which we'll show here. Uh, we'll display the accuracy to two decimal places and as a percentage. So we're gonna multiply this by 100 and that's gonna be results sub one. All right, uh, let's also indent this over so that they're lined up. And we can see, um, probably gonna get something in line with this, about 37% hopefully, maybe 39. Oh, 44, all right. But we don't have too many images, so. Okay, let's see a confusion matrix. So we'll generate some predictions. Um, that will be model.predict on the test images. Um, however, if we look at what this looks like, um, this might just take a moment while it makes the predictions, but this is gonna be the probability values. So each prediction is actually a set of nine probability values that sum to one. That's because that's the output of our model. We have nine values with the softmax activation. That's what we're getting back here. So we want 
the location of the highest probability. Uh, we could use numpy.max to get the highest probability, and we can use numpy.argmax to get the location of the highest probability. We just have to make sure we're taking the max, the argmax over axis one, and then we should get back the numeric uh, integer classifications for each image. And you can see now we each we have a classification for each image. And it looks like there's looking like a lot of eights and a lot of fours. I see one one, so it's not very promising. Uh, we're going to see this in the confusion matrix, though. We'll get a little more insight. So we'll create the confusion matrix. I'll call it CM. So that'll be confusion matrix of test images dot labels. That's going to be the actual values for our predictions, and then predictions will be what we'll compare it to. Now I'm going to uh, also create a classification report that will aid us in analyzing the confusion matrix, and that's classification report from sklearn. Here I want to specify some target names, uh, so I don't just want to see uh, numbers like this. I want to see the actual names, and we can get that with test images. Uh, well, actually, it would be train images. Train images dot class indices, and that will show us the mapping uh, between the value and the uh, integer. Now, we only you'll notice this is already in order, so we're just going to get the keys of this dictionary, uh, and we'll turn that into a list, and then we're going to use these as our target names. So target names, whoops. is that. And now let's plot the confusion matrix with a figure size of 10 by 10 with seaborn.heatmap of CM, turning on annotations, formatting with a G so that we see it as integers and not scientific notation, setting the minimum color value to zero, giving it a color map of blues, and turning off the color bar. Uh, then we will give it some tick marks on the x-axis uh, so we're going to specify the spacing of the ticks first, and that will just be a NumPy A range with nine values. And I'm going to in, uh, indent them over by 0.5 so that they sit in the middle of each box. Then the labels will also be our tar uh, what we had for target names, so that list there. We'll do exactly the same thing for the Y ticks. Then we'll give it some axis labels. So X label will be predicted, since we're seeing the predicted values on the X axis, and the Y label will be the actual since that's where the actual values go. Then we'll have a title that will be confusion matrix. And we'll give, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll just show it, plt.show. Last thing is to print out the classification report. So I'll put some hyphens and then a CLR. All right, let's see what this looks like. We're not expecting very good results, I must point out. Yeah, and sure enough, you can see <laughs> almost all of our classifications are only in two categories. Now, we did okay within those categories. Uh, you can see the, the actually, we're looking for recall here. The recall for gondola is 0.76. The recall for silbo is 0.83. That's saying out of all the actual gondolas, we got 76% correct. And all of the actual silboats, we got 83% uh, correct. However, the precision is not so great. Our precisions are not good. That's saying uh, out of we're predicting too many as sailboat and too many as gondola when they really should be spread out across the classes. Um, but yeah, the real issue here is the class imbalance. So uh, if we wanted to fix this, like I said, we may want to uh, create some augmented images to like uh, populate the undersampled classes. Uh, I actually want to expand this a little, maybe 12 by 12, so that we don't have overlapping uh, axis ticks. Um, but yeah, so maybe some, some oversampling uh, would work. Uh, but that was some of today's video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content, and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.